Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode. I'm Mike Monticello. I'm John Linkov. And I'm Joe Veslack. So before we really get into the heart of the show, we just want to tell you guys about some big news, which is after a long time of publishing this podcast every Friday afternoon, we're going to switch it up and start doing it on Wednesdays, which we're hoping is going to be better for all you out there. Uh, I think of it as more for your money, right? Because you're getting it earlier in the week. So that's mm -hmm. more for your money. Maybe? Well, it's free. So sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, of course, don't forget you know, to subscribe to the show, whether you listen to it as a podcast or uh, watch it on YouTube. And you can even get a notification on your phone at like 5 a.m. Wednesday mornings. And I think of it like, you know, to remind you to watch the show. And what would you rather have, an annoying alarm or like the sweet, silky voice of John Linkov talking about cars first thing in the morning? I, That's true. I'd go with that. So the app will be my voice? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. That's good. Um, now, for those of you that are watching the show today, you might think there's something a little different about this episode. What is it? It's your oh, shirt. It's my shirt. Yeah. No, it's Joe Veselak. <laughs> he is back after a little bit of a hiatus from his podcasting. He was in the early editions of this podcast years ago. Now he's back, was it, what was it, the extra 10 bucks that they pay us per episode brought you back, is that what it was? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Now, uh, Joe, <laughs> 10 bucks. <laughs> Joe has one of the coolest jobs here at uh, Consumer Reports and, and Auto Test Center because he does basically all of the instrumented testing on all the vehicles here. And to me, Joe, it just seems like a dream job. So tell us a little bit about the tests that you do and like which one of them is your most favorite? Which one do you enjoy doing the most? Um, I'd, I'd say track handling the most, but yeah. yeah, I do acceleration, braking, fuel economy, avoidance maneuver. Those are fun. Avoidance maneuver is pretty fun. Acceleration's fun, especially with like these electric cars are really fast now. Yeah. So there's something to be said about that. But yeah, track handling is really the most yeah, that's when, we, that's when we really get to take the cars and push them to the limits. Although the avoidance maneuver seems to me like the, to me, seems like the hardest. Do you, I mean, have you done it so much now at this point? It's not because, I mean, the narrow lane you guys have to go through and snake through this narrow lane and do these super quick steering <laughs> actions. I mean, does that not even phase you anymore? Yeah, that's, it's about consistency and yeah, it's consistency, doing the same thing every time. Your lane position, obviously, you're restricted due to the cones, but you still have a little bit of wiggle room there. So, yeah, it, yeah, time. The more you do it, the better you get. Yeah. And you just be consistent with yourself. Like, Ryan's consistent with himself. I'm consistent with myself. And we can actually stack our numbers pretty close to each other. And that's kind of what all of our testing is about. Everything you do is about consistency like even when you're doing the brake runs right like every yeah, yeah. there's a there's a cool and exact cool down you do after every single yep. brake run right so that, yeah so that every vehicle gets treated the exact same way yeah it's very robotic you do one stop one cool down lap another stop another cool down lap and you move on from dry to wet but yeah pretty methodical yeah well we're happy to have you back on the show thank you um so let's get into the car of the week and this is going to be the 2023 lexus lx 600 um, it was actually redesigned for the 2022 model year. We've rented a 2023 version. For those of you that, that may not know, we, we buy every car we test, uh, but so we occasionally get some in that we rent from automakers, which is what we did in this case, because we're not gonna buy this LX600, and we'll explain later kind of why we're not going to, but so we've rented it, and uh, it basically has been for years a more upscale version of the Toyota Land Cruiser, and the big news there is that, unfortunately, Toyota's not bringing the Land Cruiser, this new redesigned Land Cruiser, to the U.S. market anymore. It's going to be in other markets, but not here. So the LX600 is the big luxury uh, off-road SUV. Not like the Land Cruiser was not luxurious, I know. at least in our market right. for years. Right. You know, it, was, it was really nice, and then it was super really nice with right. the Lexus. So it, it does kind of make sense. I mean, they're almost cannibalizing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so... What's new here? Well, it's still, you know, it's a burly truck like it was before. It's a body on frame design, solid rear axle. Uh, and the big news, though, is that it switched from a V8 to a 3.4 liter twin turbo V6 with 409 horsepower, 479 pound feet of torque. That's actually more power than the old V8 made, which is pretty impressive. Um, 10 speed automatic transmission, four wheel drive with low range gearing. The EPA says the 2023 LX should get 19 miles per gallon combined. And EPA's combined is similar to what we do, our overall. We call it overall, they call it combined. Correct. Um, automatic emergency braking with pedestrian bicyclist detection. 
blind spot warning, rear cross traffic warning, lane departure warning, lane keeping assistance, lane centering assistance, adaptive cruise control, and automatic high beams. We rented this 2023 Lexus LX600 luxury, which is actually the fourth tier trim out of five, okay? With a few options, it came to $109,000, $109,945. So, John, I'm gonna throw it to you because <laughs> Who is buying, I mean, who is buying a $110,000 SUV? Uh, you? No. no J it, I mean, it's, it's, so look, it's it's three rows. It's, it has the cachet. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's the same answer as the, who's buying the GLS, Mercedes-Benz GLS? Who's buying the Land Rover, Range Rover? Yep. You know, yeah. I mean, these are, these are appearance vehicles. They're certainly, you sit up high, you sit, in, ensconced in a in a cabin like that ensconced. is I hope I use the word right <laughs> yeah. uh, that's so quiet you're not really hearing anything you know from the outside you're not hearing engine noise you're not hearing wind noise I mean it's 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 the first class seat ish I mean yes I know there are more bespoke SUVs out there right. but it's the first class seat you know you could you could fly in business and you could fly in you know select business select plus or whatever this is the first class seat are people using these I mean I don't really believe that people are taking the new hundred thousand dollar plus Range Rover and going up rock hills like what we have. I don't think they're you're going to go find that uh, spillway like in the commercial and they're driving up a spillway in it to show right. you know how capable the vehicle is. It's 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 an appearance vehicle, yeah. um, but they also people are counting on the fact that it's quick, it's safe because it's just a big vehicle around them. It has all the safety features at the price. Uh, that market. Yeah. Are they wrong for that? I'm not judging, but yeah. certainly not how I'm spending my money. I'll yeah. tell you that much, even if I had it. Right. All right. So, Joe, this is a redesigned LX. Let's talk about what what's it like to drive, especially focused on this, you know, this new powertrain going from a V8 to a, a twin turbo V6. Uh, do you do you enjoy driving it? And what are the aspects that you like about it? I yeah, I do enjoy driving. I. I think it's a cool looking vehicle. I think the concept is cool. And it drives a lot like a truck, a nicer truck. It rides pretty rough, but I can kind of look past it for that coolness factor that it has going on. What do you think of the, how do you like the, the, the turbo V6 versus a V8? Do you miss the V8? You know, cause there's something about a big burly V8. Yeah, right? so the V8 is nice because that lower end power delivery, you can roll on the power very, very smoothly. The V6 is great transmission everything's great yeah. it just requires a little more effort it's easy to get used to but the v8 is silky smooth yeah do you miss the v8 it's been a while since driving the land cruiser and such um but you know what i the don't v8 i know like. i know what the v8 is like i yeah. mean it depends on it, it's it, a v8 could be great but if it's paired with a <laughs> right. junk transmission for that's example, true it's not, not that great. is true um at first, I forgot, or I wasn't aware of the engine change and the displacement and the, and the, the, the tur twin turbocharging. What did you think it was? I thought, oh, they're still a V8. Oh, you okay. know, they're, it's still so just a big, big that's old That's a positive big sign. Old engine. Yeah. yeah. You know, it, only until looking into it and we right. were talking about it, they realized, oh, yeah, they did. They moved to the same engine or similar yeah. engine as they're, they've been populating their line with, which makes sense. But it, I say that in the sense of not that there was a early exhaust note or there was some kind of like low down rumble. It was just more of, the power was there. You didn't have right. the end. It wasn't working hard. It wasn't straining. Right. So I looked at it in that respect. Yeah. Um, because you know, I'm, uh, what, what do you care about the badge on the back of it or something like that? No. It's like can can it get out of its way? Great, it can. Yeah. So it's a big truck, and the, the the engine the engine transmission worked just like you said. Yeah. It worked very well together, and it pulled it. It can definitely get out of its way. There's no question about that. Um, V8 sounds good. The V8 sounds mm -hmm. good. I think, but there's so much artificialness now. You know, yeah. you never know what the heck it is. I, you know, you're losing. I felt you were losing a little bit of refinement that you know uh, that you 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 know, you, know that you would have had with the V8. There's just something you know a little more. I wouldn't say it's coarse, but it's more coarse than a V8. Mm -hmm. And and there even is some vibrations. Like if you're accelerating hard, you can feel some vibrations through the steering wheel. Nothing mm -hmm. terrible, but something you wouldn't have noticed. Uh, yeah, a little lack of refinement yeah. in comparison. Right, I but plenty say. quick, you know, sure. and considering how heavy this thing is, that's pretty impressive. What did you think of the handling? I mean, this is a big, I mean, this isn't a vehicle you really care about handling, but you still need it to handle sure, well. Sure, sure, um, it Never in, I, I, the nights, the days and nights I had it, never felt uh, that it was ro super rolly. It did. It felt 
tied down. Yeah. That said, you're still aware of the bulk of the vehicle. Yeah. You're, and, and it's actually, I find, like many things, it gets a little smaller at speed. You know, many big vehicles, you, they feel a little little smaller as you, as you go faster. In parking situations, it was really burdensome almost. It has a, I found the turning Just radius. Just because it's so huge? Or? The size and the turning radius, yeah. a very big turning radius is one of the f- few vehicles I've driven recently where I just could not get the judgment of pulling into a space correctly. Yeah. Um, particularly, not, you know, I'm, you don't want to hit another vehicle when you're parking, but what? particularly, yeah, it's, it's, we've <laughs> seen, by we've, braille. Seen, we've seen the damage on our cars, <laughs> but when you're borrowing the car, you know, you're borrowing from an oh, auto yeah, manufacturer, okay. it's, it's like an extra step of worry. You don't want to be that person. Yes. And a lot of turns in parking lots yeah. were, were at, you know, K turn type things. Yes. Could I, could I get down the pattern once I owned it? Yes, right. certainly. Um, but it felt it was big and bulky in parking better when driving. Right. Joe, go ahead. Yeah, that's where I enjoy the or appreciate the the traditional shifter because when you're going back and forth between forward and reverse a lot in those situations, it's easier and second nature yeah. after you you know it is refreshing when you come across a, a traditional gear yeah. shifter than yeah. you know regular yeah. PRNB. Yeah. Well, um Joey, I know we you didn't take this through the avoidance maneuver, but what is something like this like to take through those things? Because it's wide, it's big, it's heavy. The line, the lane must feel super narrow. In one yeah. Of these, right? So when I was talking before about consistency and that wiggle room you have within the lane, you don't really have that in these vehicles. And the challenge is actually just navigating the course rather really? than, yeah, it, it's, it requires a lot of work and learning your corners, knowing exactly how close you can get to the cones. Cause that really is what ultimately gets you the best run yeah. through is getting tight to the cones. And those vehicles are not easy. And the steering is like, you're putting so much steering input in. Because it's a lot of work, slowly, right? yeah, yeah, compared to a regular, and require vehicle. more, you know, maybe over a half a turn more right. than a sure. typical. So one. lots of movement with the steering wheel. Um, obviously, this is a, a big SUV. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, second and third row comfort space. Where do you stand with that? It's or sit with that. Get it? <laughs> this guy <laughs> um, with this. It's interesting that the third row establishes the flat. So it folds down as low as possible. The second row folds higher. So there's a step up. So, so it's not a flat load for It's not a first. flat load when for you, first when of all. When you hold the seats down. Right, okay. right. Um, so that's just annoying. Right. It's not awful, but right. it's weird. You know, you want, you, it, it's weird. I took my son, my, both my son and my daughter play the upright bass. Yep. So, you know, you're both putting- Both of them do? They both. At the same time? They're both on the same No, we one. actually have individual <laughs> bases. You, you could rent them. Um, <laughs> Those things are gigantic, right? They're bigger than you. Yeah. So, <laughs> that's true. So anyway, it's it's sitting at, at this weird angle and I'm worried about it then becoming out of tune. It, right. it, it's, it's, again, someone would be like, oh, that's a little, that's a violin, get it? Yes. Uh, yeah. Jokes. Yeah. Um, Yes, it's a minor thing, but again, if you're loading in boxes, you're loading in, you're loading things in, you kind of expect a flat load floor. So it was odd to have that, yeah. uh, that just to see that step because you see so often now, it's it, auto manufacturers make the extra effort. They, they raise the back just to make sure that you have that flat floor. Right. Um, the second row seats are fixed. Yeah. So meaning they can't they move can't move forward for or aft, yeah. and they're flat. They weren't particularly comfortable. Yeah. Um, I didn't find a lot of leg room. Now I put the front seat. At my spot, like, turn the, when you turn this one off, it was set with the comfort exit, so the yeah. seat would back off. So yeah. turn the car on, set my position, get in the back seat. Not a ton of knee room, um, under thigh room wasn't great. The third yeah. row is just for kids only. Yeah, it's. Did you try sitting back there? Yeah, not, so not that, no, I just yeah, your knees go up to your ears. You there's no thigh support, and yeah, it's really like I don't know, five minute ride to. Does, some does that seem like a quick trip? A missed point to you, Joe, to you know, have a second and third row. I mean, it's one thing if the third row is not that comfortable, but for the second row to really not be that comfortable with a seat, that doesn't that seem like a huge Yeah, I would up? I would be making sure the second row is all good, really comfortable before I moved on to the third row, rather than compromising the second row for a third row that yep. doesn't perform that great at all. Yep. Yeah, I'm with you. I totally agree. In in the la- I remember the last the Land Cruiser. Now again, you're talking decade plus of design, yeah, design and decade plus, two two decades of, of ago design right. wise. I mean, it was just different as far as safety technology, comfort technology, what they had to use room for in the vehicle, what was already eaten up. But it was generously proportioned, and it's odd that it's it's just odd that in a in a world that, so everyone makes a three row SUV now. Everyone everyone right. needs a three row SUV. This one is a compromise. Yeah, yeah, it looks cool because it's smaller, a little more compact, but you're giving up that the extra room exactly. that you need from a third row SUV. And 
it is in theory i'm sure very capable off-road again you know i mean that's what the the lx has been that's what the land cruiser has been but again to your point how many people are truly going to be doing that so you know why design all that capability in but before we get I, we're going to come back to that in a second right. i want to talk about one last thing which is fit and finish this is a hundred ten thousand dollar vehicle and I thought it was pretty nice. It's nice inside. You can't get in and say it's not nice. Like if we were to score this, we'd probably give it our top mark for our fit and finish. I mean, there would be vehicles that would get higher marks within that, say we rate a one, two, three, four, five. It would get a five. In the range. But yeah. it, it would be within that top range. But, you know, there's matte wood trim on the doors and center console. There's lots of piano black and silver trim all over the place. There's some letdowns too. I mean, their rear window sills are unpadded. That's almost unheard of for a vehicle like this. Unlined door pockets. The door pockets have a visible mold line and a slightly rough edge. The glove box is totally unlined, which is, again, not heard of for a vehicle in this price range. And it just feels like it feels more, it, it feels like it should be nicer. Well, this Don't was, think this was that? the fourth highest? Fourth highest. Oh, so that's the fifth highest. They get the line. There you go. There you go. <laughs> so for me, I, okay. Anyway, I thought that was a, it's nice, but it should be better. If you're going to pay that kind of money, it should be really something yeah, inside. It's, I would say it's probably the lower, it's the low five yeah. out of all of them. And there's a lot of nice, nicer options. Yeah. It, it's, it's kind of weird with, with where you're talking about daily driver cars that are 40,000 a star, you know, Accords and coming in at 40,000 easy or something like that. You know, you're, you're, everything's pushing up so high. Right. You get into 100,000, 100,000 is unheard of for people to buy, right. you know, for, for most people to buy us, right. you know, not being jaded. But at the same time, you're going, where is 100,000 now? Is, you know, 150, what 100 used to be? I mean, right. what, what do you get for this money? It's, and it's, well, it's, let's. I don't want to say scary, but it's weird. It's weird to think of that where you're finding mold lines and things like that in right. the $100,000 plus vehicle. Well, to, to that point, John, uh, last question to you both is if it was your money, would you uh, consider this LX600 or is there something that you think uh, maybe does a better job for less money than the LX? And we'll start with you, Joey. What would you go with? Yeah, I, I would pick either a Yukon Denali or an Escalade. Just yeah. something, I'm not thinking off-roading. I, I'm, that's out the window for right. everything, for both of those. But yeah, for more for capability, having more room. And I don't think for, yeah, I think I enjoy driving the Escalade or that Yukon better. So you'd stick with a uh, kind of traditional body on frame SUV, but you'd save some money, still have a really nice vehicle. What would you, what about you? So it's a, it's a tough thing. I mean, reliability of some of these. That's true. The the GM vehicles, you know, the new Jeeps, the the Wagoneer. I mean, yeah. those are certainly nice, but I mean, the fuel economy is horrible, and they're they're massive. So you think reliability, Lexus, Toyota, but of course it's new. Like right. so much of this vehicle is right. new. So a first year model or even second year model, even from Toyota, they sometimes you know they get down to average. Okay, but average still means you're you're taking the dealer. It's hard. I mean, I'm not, I, I would say maybe based on our data as well as experience in X7. Yeah. Um, BMW X7. Yeah. Uh, I'm right with both of you. I, I think uh, the X7 is a great choice. Uh, I would also consider a Ford Expedition Max or a Chevrolet Tahoe. Honestly, my, my gut pick would be the Jeep Wagoneer, which, you know, it's just got this, um, it's, it's very, it rides super smooth. It's very quiet, has a lovely V8. Again, the downside being the reliability. It may, you know, it's probably not going to be as reliable. That as third this. row is fantastic yeah. in the wagon. It, it's, the it's, I, I would go with that. Anyway, we have a lot more information up on our website, consumerreports.org, about the 2023 Lexus LX600. So make sure you go and check that out. And now we're going to move on to our audience question of the week. Folks, don't forget to send those questions, comments, 30 second video clips at talkingcars at iCloud.com. You know, we love hearing from you. And my best friend, producer Dave Abrams, he gets all of these, and honestly, I look at him sometimes behind camera number one, and he looks kind of like a sad, lonely man. So send him <laughs> some really tough questions. Make his day, folks. Uh, so with that, this week's question comes to us from Peter, who says, I have a 2023 BMW Z4 on order, which will be my fun weekend car. I would have preferred to purchase an EV, but EV convertibles are not yet available. But looking forward, I am concerned in the future that gas stations will become scarce and how quickly that change will happen. Most people are unconcerned because the tipping point feels like a lifetime into the future. But with so many states and provinces announcing the phasing out of new gasoline car sales by 2035, I am reminded of the rise of cell phones in the 1990s. 
Predictions were it would take decades to blanket North America with towers to provide service, but the huge demand accelerated adoption faster than anyone imagined. How do you see the transition from gasoline to electric happening in terms of availability of gas for legacy vehicles? John, I'm going to throw this to you. Um, so s- we're still building a lot of gasoline-powered vehicles, and there's still a huge market of gasoline-powered used cars out there. So I don't think that we're going to see a, a, uh, a sudden decrease in the availability of stations in, in gasoline. But it's a, it is a very valid point because – where along the line from drilling to fuel in your vehicle, who's going to start pulling back? Because it's not, they don't, they don't see the financial future. Right. If I had that, I'd be investing like crazy in a certain market. So I don't have that oh, I answer. Thought, see, I asked because I thought you knew the answer. I don't have that answer no. as far as where it's going, where the tipping point is going right. to be. But it's a certainly a, a very, a valid, it's a valid concern. Question. Yeah. But at the same time, you have automakers like Porsche, for example, working on a non petroleum fuels. Uh, they're going to be using in, in, in race series. And, and it, it's, that takes a lot of energy to create this form of energy. So it, it, it's, it's, it's a chicken and egg. It's a cliche, cliche. Um, I too have thought of that. I still will buy probably my next vehicle will probably be at, if it at most a hybrid right. type, but it would certainly be internal combustion engine uh, based right. uh, for a family vehicle. Um, I, I, I'm still bullish on the fact that there was going to be gasoline available. But to his point about the towers, I don't know if we're going to see the rollout of electricity, electric uh, charging stations as fast right. as he talks about in, in his uh, in his question. And yeah, it's totally a valid question. Uh, but I think the difference is you're going to have, I mean, this is 2035, not for all states, right? This is some states. So not... Yes. So some of the car, the California Air Resource, right? Stays. So, yep. but you've also got a huge used car fleet, a huge mm-hmm. car fleet that's out there that's going to need gas for a long, long time. I mean, so I, I think it's. I don't think it's gasoline. That might be a very, very slow fade away. I don't see that happening quickly. Maybe EV chargers show up really quick, or at this rate at which we're seeing them, you see that, but. And also people still like going to the gas station for an experience to get, pick up their coffee or whatever. And a certain, I think they're, that'll keep them around a little bit too. Yeah. I, I, I personally think it's, it's, you're, you're fine with your Z4, enjoy it. Certainly. Uh, I think it's still a ways out. Not that we shouldn't consider that, but also with different fuels coming, possibly maybe it won't be quite, maybe it won't become all EV adoption when, as soon as people think it might be. We'll yeah. I, I'm not worried if, uh, I, I don't buy into the, like, Oh, the grid's going to collapse, right. but the the fact that you have so much of this, well, what incentive for this company to do it and what network, the networks that we can all, that we, it, you can easily switch from network to network, not like this is only a charge point, this is only this, and I have to go all the way to another town to charge because they've chosen this one. Can't be that way. That's going to be a mess. Right. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, that's going to do it for this episode. Of course, Joe, we're so happy to have you back in the fold. Thank Look you. Look forward to seeing more of you on the podcast. Uh, if you want to learn more about the cars and John too, we're happy to have John, John on the podcast. If you want to learn more about the cars and the topics that we talked about, you can click on the links in the show notes. Don't forget to send those questions, comments, 30 second video clips at talkingcars at iCloud.com. Folks, thanks so much for watching and we'll see y'all next week.